Well, welcome. I am Sue Britton. I'm CEO of Firefly Growth. Uh, I have come all the way from sunny BC to uh, the Bank of Canada in Ottawa. Um, and I'm here to uh, have a discussion with Ron Morrow. Ron Morrow is Executive Director of Supervision for the Bank of Canada. Hey, Sue. Good to see you. Nice to see well, you, too. Welcome to Ottawa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Ron, we're going to spend time on the Retail Payments Activities Act. That's, you know, the bulk of what we're going to talk about. But I want to give some context for people who maybe aren't as in the payments space and understand how everything works um, as to how some of the major announcements lately all work together and work separately. And so this is five payment functions. If you perform one of them or all of them, you are, uh, you need to be registered. Can we walk through sure. each of those five? Absolutely. So the new regime cares a lot more about what you do rather than who you are as an institution. So if you perform one of these five payment functions and you're not otherwise exempted from the act, and we'll, we can get to that, then you're, uh, you're a payment service provider that will be overseen by the bank. So the first of those uh, five payment functions is maintaining an account for the purposes of making payments. So you're a company that uh, uh, allows people to set up accounts uh, to lodge their personal and financial information with you for the purposes of allowing them to make payments in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the first of the five. In the fintech world, one of the popular categories of fintechs is, is um, often referred to as challenger banks, um, which let's just say in that category they don't have banking licenses, so mm -hmm. they're really not banks. Correct. Um, but what they use is a prepaid uh, card product provided by many different players. Um, one example of that would be Coho. Mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. Coho helps their clients ma and many others like Coho um, set up accounts and so that would be one, one real live example of. I, I think that's, that's a good example. Now the details matter in terms of how yeah. people set up their, their business uh, but something, something like that would, would uh, on the surface of it, yes, fall into the maintaining account category of being a payment service provider. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second is uh, holding funds for the mm -hmm. purposes of making payments. So this is pretty straightforward. You're, you're a company who, you know, I can send money to you and, and you will hold my money for me mm -hmm. uh, till, until some later date when I'll use that money to make a payment or, you know, transfer it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretty straightforward category. Maybe Starbucks. <laughs> the no, so so no, it wouldn't be Starbucks. Okay. A, a good question. The, PayPal. Uh, PayPal is an, an example of a company that could very well fall into this category. So no, single merchant kind of payment products like a Starbucks mm -hmm. uh, account mm -hmm. are exempt. It's really for broad payments mm -hmm. activities. Mm -hmm. So if if you you know move money into account by a payment service provider. I think PayPal is a good uh, yeah. uh, example of a potential uh, PSB. Yes, that's the, the type of thing we're thinking about when it comes to, to yeah. holding funds. Yeah, and I think the next category is initiating an EFT. Exactly, so initiating an EFT is probably the most, the, the example that probably is easiest for people to understand is something they do, well, if not every day, most mm -hmm. days, which is tapping your card on yeah. a payment terminal. Right. So the terminal itself isn't initiating the payment transaction, but the software on the payment terminal that's taking the information from your card and the information from the merchant and moving along through a number of different entities to ultimately move the money out of my account mm -hmm. into the merchant's account, right. that would be initiation, that, that first tap of the card. Okay, so an example of that would be Moneris. Yeah, the, the, the credit card acquirers are, are, are the type of entities that you could see potentially falling into, falling into this category. Okay, interesting. Authorizing, an, and we should say EFT is electronic funds transfer yep. for those that might not know the bank lingo. Authorizing an EFT or transmitting, receiving, or facilitating instructions about one. So this is probably the broadest category. So uh, think of a payment transaction usually involves a chain of different entities involved in passing the information along uh, to ultimately move the money from me to someone else. Uh, so and it, you know anyone who's within that payment chain who's maybe not moving the money, but they're moving the message mm. that will move the money, mm -hmm. uh, then that would scope them in uh, as, as, a, as a PSP. As I said, this is probably the broadest category. Right. Finally, clearing or settling 
electronic fund transfers. Oh, well, uh, clearing and settling payments is probably the narrowest uh, yeah, category right. amongst you all You would of know them. who's doing that, right? <laughs> uh, well, there, there, there aren't many, many firms who do this. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, probably the, the greatest example that would fit in this category where you could think maybe there's clearing and settling going on would be uh, would be the card companies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh, but they're going to be caught up. They're caught up as prominent payment. Visa and Mastercard are caught yeah. up as prominent payment systems right. here in Canada, rather than being subject to the RPA. Right, and I think the important part about understanding who's subject to it and who's not is everyone's subject to supervision of some sort. It's mm -hmm. whether or not they fall under the Retail Payments Activities Act. So, right? I mean, you know, there there are just other ways that other participants are being supervised. A absolutely. I mean, if you go back to the original uh, motivation behind this legislation and this activity, it's that uh, uh, holding or moving people's money is actually a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, there should be some minimum standards that people meet. In many cases, payment service providers in Canada are subject to no real oversight. Maybe there may be anti-money anti laundering rules overseen by FinTrack. So the idea here, here behind the regime wa was to create a minimum standard for everyone, uh, and but also not be duplicative. So mm -hmm. the, if you're a bank or a credit union, and you're already overseen by, in the case of a bank, you're overseen by OSFI, in the case of a credit union by your provincial regulator, mm -hmm. you're already subject to a host of rules mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are geared towards making sure you do a good job of managing risk and protect, protecting people's uh, money. So, you know, that's why entities like that are, are exempt because they, there's no need to be duplicative. That, that oversight yeah. is already being done by another supervisor. Yeah. Well, okay, so hopefully that helps people. I mean, I think the best case scenario is, um, you know, if you have anything to do with payments, you should probably investigate, you know, registering. It's not like you're going to register folks that aren't actually performing a payment function. So, you know, by default, better to check. Better to check. I, I think based on the work that we've done, the homework we've done so far, so our best guess is there are uh, about 2,500 uh, payment service providers operating here in Canada. And it's more than, it's an informed guess. So we, by virtue of the legislation, we share information with uh, our colleagues at uh, at FinTrack, so you know we know who the money service businesses are, the MSBs operating mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. Many, the a, a strong majority of MSBs are likely to be yeah. PSPs and likely to be fintechs, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and yeah. and uh, the it covers a, a broad array of uh, yeah. of entities. We've also over the past couple of years been doing our own homework. I mean, we've we've done our best to identify who are the payment service providers who are operating in Canada. So we have a, a pretty good starting point idea of uh, who we, we think is covered by the act. But I, again, to repeat myself, the details mm -hmm. matter. How they structure themselves and how they perform those payment functions, uh, will so there'll be a lot of black and white cases, but there may be some shades of gray where we yeah. need to get more info to understand <laughs> how they conduct their business. I imagine the uh, the legal counsel and uh, and risk folks are all you know trying to figure that out themselves. So there'll be be some uh, interesting conversations. Well, the good news is we're we're doing what we can to to help out. So that first guidance document is going to be all about scope. It's mm -hmm. going to be all about who's in, who's out. Uh, it's going to be our best effort to help people to understand whether or not they've ca they're caught up uh, by this legislation right. or not. Right. So you mentioned, you know, this this estimate at 2,500 PSPs. I think most people are surprised at that number. They think that's too big. Um, I mean, I spent eight years, you know, sort of tracking fintech companies in Canada, and um, I think anyone is going to debate, no matter what number you put out. <laughs> um, that's been my experience. But um, so, what happens if some if those don't some of those don't register? Let's say you haven't been able to you know, reach them or potentially, um, frankly, haven't been able to actually get them to understand that this is something for them. So w between now and uh, November of next year, which is when registration is going to open up, uh, we have a whole s swath of outreach activities geared towards making people understand what's required of them uh, under the new act. If uh, people choose not to register, as I said, we, we have a, between the list of MSBs and our own work, we have, uh, I, we think, a pretty good idea of who's out there. 
part of our outreach campaign will be reaching out directly to those entities to say, you know, we think you may be, and you know, yep. uh, uh, you should uh, you should put some thought into this. So let's suppose uh, the registration window in November comes and goes, and uh, people haven't registered. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's where we'll we'll follow up pretty quickly. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that the first step will be. Uh, a, uh, uh, we'll reach out to them and say, you know, we couldn't help but notice that you didn't uh, mm -hmm. register. We think you're subject to this. May, might re involve a request for information from them to, for us to clarify whether they're in or out, and yeah. they'll have an opportunity to register. After that, the uh, a much less nice letter uh, saying sure. yeah. uh, it's really time to register, and if you don't, our next communication will be from our enforcement division, right. and then that's the next layer: enforcement. The, the the like this whole regime only works if PSPs actually register. Yeah. So it's critical for us to make sure that anyone who is performing these functions is in, and we'll use the enforcement tools uh, at hand, which yeah. uh, include a, a swath of uh, things we can do: monetary penalties, uh, the uh, publishing the names of people who who who've refuse to register are all mm -hmm. all actions we can take. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about like maybe a little more deeper into some of the workings of RPA. So one of the one of the things that I think will give um, some of the certainly the you know the smaller companies some angst is the registration fees and um, and clearly you have to you know cost recovery is it makes sense you have to mm -hmm. cover your costs. Um, can you talk to us about how, like things like proportionality sure. or um, you know sort of the uh, you know aligning the costs for these small companies with um, uh, with their size, with the value and the volume a of payments? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think when we think about fees, w the we have some principles in place. We want to be as uh, uh, you know we want the fee structure to be transparent. We want it to be simple. We want it to be predictable. So for registration, there will be a registration fee. It's $2,500, and it'll be in indexed to inflation going forward. And that's same, just same registration fee for same PayPal the, as for It doesn't matter what size of organization you are. It's okay. $2,500 because the it'll take the same amount of time and effort for us to go through each application to determine whether or not someone is in, in scope or not with, uh, with the regime. <laughs> Once we're up and running, as a regime, there will be a, an annual cost recovery. So j just as OSFI recovers its costs from the industry, provincial regulators recover their costs from uh, from the industry. We'll be doing the same thing. We do. We will aim to anchor our uh, our cost recovery fees uh, on the basis of how large, interconnected, ubiquitous you are as a PSP, so payment volumes and values mm -hmm. uh, serve as a good proxy for that, whether or not you hold end-user funds, because there might be more risk if you actually hold end-user end funds will be, are, are the things we think make sense to, mm -hmm. to, to gauge the fees. Our challenge today is we don't have the data on the volume and value of payments that PSPs are processing to be able to mm -hmm. you know, calibrate what a sensible fee structure looks like. The good news mm. is that when, as PSPs register, we're going to get that information and we'll be able to uh, come up with an approach that we think strikes the right balance yeah. and you know, fairly allocates these fees. We don't, on the one hand, we don't want to overly burden small PSPs. On the other hand, we don't want to be, you know, have large PSPs paying way more than their fair share uh, yeah. for the regime as well. Yeah. Do you think it's going to be a net increase across the board in costs for everybody, or will be this the mother cost that will go away? I, I, I don't see any way around the fact that bringing in a, a, super, a regulatory regime is going to create some costs for PSPs. Right. So right. they're going to be the running costs of, uh, uh, of for cost recovery pur purposes, I would imagine uh, many PSPs are also going to have to take some actions mm -hmm. to make sure that they're in full compliance with uh, with the act. So there are some mm -hmm. costs there. Mm -hmm. You know, we're you know the quid pro quo is we we hope there are some some benefits. The ability uh, to join the real time rail for those who are interested, but equally right. by becoming part of the regulated sphere of. Uh, 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 or the sphere of regulated entities here within Canada, we hope it makes it easier for PSPs to interact with other regulated entities like banks or credit right. unions. Yeah. I mean, I guess ultimately at any stage, a small business, if we think of, you know, PSPs on the smaller end of the scale, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you know, might be doing something they can because there's no regulation preventing them from doing it until, you know, RPAA and now they may look at it and say, maybe it's not my core business and it may, it may make them decide to go and find an alternative way um, to do payments for their clients. Because I would imagine that those, you know, PSPs that are payments as material to their business will figure this out. I think so. So we, we've spoken to a lot of PSPs over the course of the last uh, couple of years, uh, both the very large, you know, multi-billion dollar international uh, mm -hmm. companies, but also the very small ones, the, you know, 30, 15, five person shop that mm -hmm. has created uh, some sort of payments product for some sort of niche group that they, yeah. they feel they can provide services to. Yeah. So when we spoke to those groups, the, uh, did they have a good idea of what the risks were to their business? Absolutely. Did they have a good plan for being able to manage and control those risks? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. Had they written down their, their operational risk framework? Well, yeah. maybe not. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I've, I've no doubt that uh, there's going to be some work for, for those players, but equally I, I think they're up to the, up to the challenge mm -hmm. of uh, meeting our, our requirements. Mm. Maybe this is a shout out to you know, entrepreneurs out there, if you can figure out a way to help the smaller end of the, of the, of the PSPs figure out how to automate some of this good stuff because it doesn't need to be complex, right? No. It needs to be, you need to follow all the process steps or what have you, but you don't, I mean, no, no small PSP is gonna hire an army of people to do this. No, and, and our, we hope, uh, the, the idea is we want our supervision to be proportional. You know, if yeah. you're a small PSP, then you should be able to write down in a pretty straightforward way, what are your risks and yeah. what are the, how, are, how are you doing to, to manage them? If you're a large multi-billion dollar PSP, you probably have you a three-inch thick board-approved risk and you binder. And maybe a few people. Let's and, <laughs> and an army of lawyers. You who, have to, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, right. you know, by not taking a one-size-fits-all approach, we're, we're hoping that we can uh, rate-size this for different, uh, different sizes of PSPs. Yeah. Retail. Why did you call it Retail Payments Activities Act? It's come up a lot. Uh, uh, I know I've chatted with you about this before, but... It makes people think that it's only for, you know, payments for consumers in, you know, retail contexts. So, so that's on us. Uh, the the fact that there's some some confusion over this. Retail was meant to, was meant in the sense of non-wholesale, not large value payments between financial institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, again, back to the who's covered by this act. If you're performing any one of those five funct functions and providing those uh, those payment functions, it doesn't matter if your your payments are for, are for are for businesses, are for people, are for uh, you know moving money between you know different entities. It, it doesn't matter who those entities are. The retail part doesn't figure into that. You're likely covered by the act. Who doesn't need to register? And even though they're performing these payment functions. And, and I, the only thing I'm wondering if when you, when you say that, can you be, can you be specific? Sure. So uh, there are a number of, of exemptions that are outlined within the legislation itself. The, as I noted earlier, if you're a bank or if you're a credit union, well, you're already subject to a host of supervision. That's why you're not uh, subject to this, uh, uh, to this act. Equally, you could think and of, Sorry to interrupt, yeah, no, but no. before you could before you go on there, so bank and credit union. Yeah. Um, there's different types of banks in Canada, mm -hmm. right? Schedule one. Yeah. Foreign banks, yeah. foreign banks with branches. There's different kinds of credit unions, federal credit unions, credit unions with bank licenses, provincial credit unions. Is all are all of those exempt? Yep. The okay. the the premise here is that if someone is already super supervising you for risk mm -hmm. and for uh, protecting end user funds, then there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel and, and do it again for you. Uh, you could also, as I define those payment functions, maintaining the account is, mm -hmm. is maybe one to focus on. So you could, be, you could be a merchant and you think, well, wait a minute, I like collect personal and financial information for people right. so that right. they can buy things off of my website. Am I suddenly a, a payment service provider? The answer is no. This, right. is, this is really geared towards people who are in the business of facilitating payments. Uh, you know, a merchant that sells shoes uh, on a, uh, you know, off sell of their shoes. website sells shoes. They're not right. in the business of providing payment services. Got it, okay. 
this idea of um, safeguarding funds and then uh, having uh, like collateralization, if that's a word, those are two different concepts. Yeah, safe, safeguarding in this concept is really about protecting end users in the event the PSP that's holding the funds uh, goes bankrupt. Right. So, and there are options for how to do this. So first, uh, uh, one of the first requirements on PSPs is that they're going to have to uh, segregate client funds. They so have to be held separately, so mm -hmm. PSPs can't commingle their own money you and, would hope that they and client money. Anyway, but the, yeah. <laughs> uh, and equally, they're also going to have to either hold that money in trust, so it's kind of protected from the event of a PSP bankruptcy, or have insurance in place to mm -hmm. uh, to uh, return funds to end users in the, in the event the PSP goes bankrupt. Uh, collateralization is a whole other concept. The, the, the you know payments in the real time rail will be fully collateralized yeah, right, to right. to reduce the risk of uh, payments risk between institutions because the money is instantly you know yeah. transmitted. Therefore, if it's not available, you can function on the real time rail. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Because I think people are getting those two concepts mixed up a little bit. Okay. Last my last question for sure. you. Um, so this is a lot of change from um, the point of view of, a, of you know, PSPs who are now going to be supervised. And um, it's a lot of change for potentially banks and credit unions. Let's say bank, let's leave it at banks because credit unions um, are not in this, you know, business directly where banks are sponsoring fintechs mm -hmm. um, to give them access to those uh, systems, whatever they are, bill payment, you know, um, EFT, whatever. And, um, and I think there's a general concern in the market that, you know, that relationship has been challenging for some of those smaller PSPs in the past where they've been debanked by some of those mm -hmm. banks. And who knows, maybe for good reason. Um, although some of the names that I have heard about are large enough that you wonder um, if there were good reason. But but my question is more about, you know, this new um, sort of regime ultimately will put some responsibility on the bank or, or whomever is the member of Payments Canada to, um, if they're sponsoring the PSPs, to make sure that they're, they're actually registered. Well, absolutely. Our, 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 uh, I'll, I'll go back to a, a something I said earlier. The by virtue of this legislation, it brings PSPs in the regulated sphere. So, if you're a, a bank or a credit union who wants to partner with a fintech or wants to offer account services to a fintech, you'll be able to go to our registration website and be able to see mm -hmm. whether or not a the PSP is registered with us, and you know what you know whether or not there there have been any issues uh, with them from a a compliance perspective uh, in the past. So our hope is that gives uh, pre creates the opportunity for broader access to financial services. The you know in the event there are ongoing challenges there, uh, the I'm sure that's something we'll take note of. Uh, we'll talk to our colleagues at the Department of Finance, and if uh, the there are changes required, the it'll be up to our colleagues at the Department of Finance to make additional changes to ensure that those challenges mm -hmm. are adequately hope, addressed. Right? Yeah. yeah, one would hope that we wouldn't have, you know, the, the, a duplication of what currently today feels like a pretty heavy hand on PSPs. Yeah. Yeah. What's your vision for all of this? I mean, you, you, you sit, you know, sort of in a very um, important position in the, in the country, responsible for, you know, all of our payments systems, um, if that's the right way to put it, but I think you know what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, competition is obviously important. You know, safety is important. But what's your vision for you know, let's say beyond RPAA? What's how do you think this is all going to turn out? Uh, well, I think it's going to turn out well. But <laughs> the, uh, my, my my broader vision, uh, the I think there's still scope for a lot of innovation within this space. I I think despite. Uh, efforts that others have made. It's still uh, expensive and complicated to move money across borders. The, the, we want the RPA to create a level playing field that gives 
uh, allows consumers to, uh, to, to, to be confident about their use of PSPs, something they're already confident in. But, and, you know, we want to get the RTR built, but we want to be able to move around that. You know, what are the types of things we can do to further reduce mm -hmm. uh, the cost of payments to consumers? How can we further enhance uh, competition? How can we create better cross-border linkages between infrastructure mm -hmm. to make it cheaper and, cheaper and easier for um, Canadians and small and medium-sized businesses to be able to move mm -hmm. money across the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is our, our, our largest, most important trading partner. How awesome would it be yeah. if businesses could cheaply and easily and quickly yeah. move money back and forth across the border? So that's, that's where I want to get to. That's yeah. the ultimate vision of all the things we're doing here. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you to the Bank of Canada for inviting me um, to talk with you. Well, th thanks, Sue, for your interest and your questions, uh, the, and for uh, doing your part to help us get the get the word out on the on the regime. Uh, uh, and we're looking forward to registering all 2,500 of yes. these payment service yes. providers in yeah. November of next year. Yeah. Well, hopefully this will help. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you again. No, thank you.